Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. This month, Marcus is going to focus exclusively on your options for building Windows desktop applications, but I'm getting ahead of myself. My name is Jim Duffy, and I'm responsible for the sales and marketing of all of our code services. As you can tell, it's also my job to kick off our webinars and introduce the presenter. Code is so much more than a magazine. Code Magazine is our flagship, of course, but our other divisions include Code Consulting, where we do custom software development projects, Code Training, and Code Staffing. If you're interested in reaching out about any of our code services, my email address is on this slide. Seeing familiar names on the attendee registration list tells me we must be doing something right month to month with these webinars. We. Who am I kidding? Marcus and our team members are responsible for the quality and success of the webinar series. I'm just the talking head who kicks them off. Whether this is your first time attending one of our webinars or the fifth, thank you so much for joining us. In addition to Marcus questions live, we have expert members of our code consulting team in the chat window to answer your questions. We're proud to announce that Fortellus will be sponsoring next month's webinar. Fortellus provides software development APIs for the automotive industry and an automotive industry marketplace for developers to market their products. Reach out to Tammy Ferguson for information about sponsoring our webinars and other code advertising opportunities. If you don't currently subscribe to Code Magazine, we can take care of that. Code Magazine is the leading software development magazine written by expert developers for developers. As a benefit for attending, all registered attendees will automatically receive a free Code Magazine subscription, provided you don't already subscribe based on the email you registered with. I've also included a free subscription link to share with your coder friends, associates, colleagues, your team lead, CTO, your social media followers, your enemies, your arch nemesis, any nerdy celebrities you might know, and so on. Our presenter today is Marcus Egger. Those of you who have attended our previous webinars or have watched videos of our previous webinars on our YouTube page, or have seen him speak at conferences or have attended any of our training classes over the years, well, you're pretty familiar with Marcus. For everyone else, Marcus is in charge around here. He's the code president, chief software architect, publisher of Code Magazine, international author and speaker, Microsoft regional director, and all around nice guy. He'll be ready to start in just a moment. Code Consulting's continuing mission is to help people build better software. We build custom software solutions from the ground up for some clients. We modernize legacy applications for others and we support, maintain, or enhance existing applications for others. Whether it's a cloud-based or on-prem solution, a web application, a mobile app, or a Windows desktop application, we can help with whatever platform you're targeting. Our team of expert developers and consultants are ready to help with your project. project. Our very popular and in-demand free hour of code service provides an opportunity for you and or your team to meet with our hand-picked team to ask any questions you may have or brainstorm architectural ideas or talk about JavaScript frameworks or discuss cloud strategies, best practices, or whatever you want to pick our brains on. No charge, no strings, no commitment, no credit card. Just free help from our code experts. Slots are limited, so reach out to me about getting your free hour of code scheduled. If you like what you see today, or have seen in our prior webinars, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Talent is something we're always on the lookout for. Whether it's adding talent to our software development teams or finding authors to write for the magazine, check out these links if you're interested. Our code staffing division can help provide developers to augment your development teams if necessary. We would like your feedback about this webinar in the form of a quick survey and we're willing to pay 100 bucks to one lucky winner. The survey is very short, and you'll finish it in no time flat. We're excited about a new open source project that we've launched called Fotino. You can use it to build native, cross-platform desktop applications using web UI technology. It's like Electron, only smaller and more lightweight. Marcus will have more information about this later in the webinar. It's almost time to turn things over to Marcus, but before I do, I wanna share with you that the slides and recording of today's webinar, and all of our webinars for that matter, will be available on the stateof.net page on the code website. I've included that link here. All right, enough from me. Thanks for listening. Take it away, Marcus. Thank you, Jim. Well, hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be, it's good morning for me as the sun is rising here where I'm 
recording or, or uh, live streaming from home again. Wow, it's been 10 months of doing this. We're almost coming up on our one year anniversary. Great to see a great crowd again. Uh, quite a few people online, as I already see. Got a ton of stuff to talk about. Uh, for those of you who've been in these presentations before, know that I'm usually not short on material and I tend to run over. I'll try to control that today as best I can. Uh, here is the agenda of what we got going today. Uh, we want to talk about desktop development, uh, which is a topic that's surprisingly popular. And we'll talk about that as the, as the presentation goes on. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, I have another slide about that later, but Microsoft is also doing a lot of stuff around that. In fact, there's a .NET Conf tomorrow. I will give you a link to that event as well, where Microsoft will announce some new things, some of the things you'll hear today. Uh, and I'm sure they'll have a few additional things as well. Uh, so lots going on there. Uh, so what are we going to talk about here today? Well, we're going to talk about fundamentally, <coughs> excuse me, uh, desktop development in a .NET 5 world. Um, now that encompasses a lot of things. We'll talk about some of the older technologies that have been brought forward, uh, in particular WinForms. We'll also talk about WPF, which is uh, the newer generation, although not the spring chicken anymore either. We'll briefly talk about UWP. We'll talk about things like WinUI and, and WebView 2 and all those things that fall under the .NET client-side development umbrella in the .NET 5 timeframe. Then we'll also branch a little bit into some of the, what I call alternative technologies, which are not as such technically .NET 5 technologies, but of course they're used in many overall setups that include .NET 5. So we can do desktop development with tools such as Electron. And then we'll also talk about this Fotino thing that Jim already mentioned in the intro. And then we'll peek a little bit into the future, talk about Blazor desktop development. We'll talk about this new thing called MAUI. And those are .NET 6 timeframe technologies, but that's not that far in the future either. .NET 6 will release in November. It's a little more than a half a year off or, or three quarters of a year off and starting to appear in previews. So this is a lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, some of it I'll do in more detail, some of it I'll just mention. As always in these presentations, our goal is to share what we think the state of those technologies are. And we try to do that by providing you insight from what we see in our own development, since we are mainly a custom software and consulting shop. So we work with a lot of customers that use these technologies. But we are also a magazine publisher, of course, and we do a lot of training and have huge community involvement. So we tend to sit in the middle of seeing all these different things and, and hear how well things are going for people, what technologies are they successful with, what do they have problems with, what are those problems. And so I'm not claiming that we've seen it all, but we do hear a lot about it. And so I aim to share that information with you in this talk here today. Now, I have my people online, my minions, they're going to watch the chat. I'll be looking over here a little bit. Uh, that's where my control monitor is, and that's where they'll feed questions to me. I'll answer all those questions. Some of it I might keep until later in the talk, and I want to always interrupt my talk to answer questions immediately. Also, uh, there's other EPS and co people in the chat. They'll try to answer questions right away. So if you have questions, feel free to fire those away. And also, like I always say, consider us a resource. Uh, we are happy to answer your questions. Send us an email, send the email to me or better yet to Jim Duffy because he's much quicker in answering emails. I have to admit I'm perpetually behind on email these days. So it's usually good if he points out to me if there's open questions, but, but do send them to us. We'll uh, happily answer your questions. We're not the kind of company that will send you an immediate bill for answering a short question or anything like that. So like I said, consider us a resource because I know that we are only scratching the surface with a lot of the things I can tell you about here today. And if you are more interested in knowing you know, how does this exactly apply to my particular project or problem, then we are, we are more than happy to answer that question. So with that said, let's dive right into it and let's get started with an overview of desktop development. And the first question that we need to answer when it comes to desktop development 
is, is this even still a thing? Do people still do that? And most certainly when you look at keynotes of big events, like let's say you are attending a Microsoft build event or anything like that, desktop development is not the sexy new thing. I mean, we've been doing desktop development for, you know, as old as, as Windows is, or even DOS, if you want to count that. So 30 plus years easily. Uh, and the new things in desktop development are just not the sexy new thing to show uh, in a keynote presentation. So don't expect that to change much, even though we do have things like tomorrow's event that Microsoft is doing where they are focusing on desktop development. But for the most part, it's just not going to be competing with things like the latest and greatest Blazor presentation in a keynote. Nevertheless, when you look at what's going on in the marketplace, desktop development is still surprisingly big. And we are in a somewhat unique position because we are a shop that still does a lot of desktop development for our customers. Now, truth be told, web development makes up the bigger amount of that. But I would say about 25 to 30, 35% of what we do is still desktop development. And that includes a lot of new development. And in a way that always surprises me, uh, how many customers are still coming to us to want to do desktop development. Now, I guess you're probably getting a bigger share of that because we are one of the few shops known to still do that. But nevertheless, it's a, it's a very large percentage of uh, people that would surprise most people. Um, another indicator that amazes me is that we generally, when we do presentations like this presentation today, is, uh, is that we get much more interest in these events than we always anticipate. So for instance, today's Stata.net event is the second most attended Stata.net event that we've ever done, relatively close behind uh, a blazer last month's blazer event actually so that's very interesting and if you are in this event obviously you do have uh, an interest in in desktop development so yes absolutely this is still a thing especially for the more serious enterprise applications this is still a thing it's also a thing for many consumer apps when it comes to something that's more like an app uh, something that might ship in the windows store there's also a lot of little things that are done that way uh, if you logged on early today for instance you saw a little countdown timer counting down the time until uh, this presentation started well that was done as a little winforms application actually uh, because it was just easier to build a winforms app that interacted with this uh, video stream than it would have been to do that as a web application so yeah absolutely desktop development is a thing uh, often very, very large, very serious applications are done that way. And, and, and that's just very, very interesting. So what can we do to do desktop development? That's usually the next question that people ask. If, if, I am, if I'm on the Microsoft platform, and that's what we're talking about here today, what can I do for desktop development? And sadly, there is no easy answer. And I've discussed that with Microsoft over the years. Uh, and I often tell Microsoft, what, what do you want me to tell people in, in talks like this? And sadly, there is no clear cut answer. Even Microsoft doesn't have a clear answer where they say, this is the one technology that you should use. Uh, so there is a ton of different options. And that's the good news. Uh, if, you are wanting, if you want to do desktop development, you have an enormous amount of options available to you. Uh, the bad news is you have an enormous amount of options available to you and which ones do you choose and which ones uh, would you consider to be the right one, right? So the lack of statements is a little bit uh, disconcerting. <clears throat> but on the other hand, having this freedom of choice of technology is actually very, very nice. And typically you can mix and match these things very well. And what's nice is that there has been a relatively great degree of stability in most of these technologies. We'll talk about that a little more, but as an example, within our own organization, we are still running some desktop apps that have been modernized probably over the entire life cycle of Visual Studio.net, so probably the last 20 years, and we've been able to bring that forward in a very stable fashion and protect that investment. And that's really nice, especially when you compare something like this 
uh, to things like web development, where most of the time it's a framework of the day sort of question. May have, maybe a little bit of an exaggeration. It's stabilized lately as well. But certainly the desktop development arena is much, much more stable than the web development stuff. The one problem is that it's often difficult to know what are major initiatives versus what are just small experimental projects. Uh, this has been particularly difficult over the last year or so because it's difficult to go uh, to something like a build event or any of the big conferences and just kind of take the temperature of the community. It's, it's one thing to see a Microsoft presentation about a new technology. It's another thing to see the buzz in the hallway about a technology or the lack thereof. So that's kind of what I'm trying to make up for today with this event by giving you a better insight into that. Now, a huge theme for me when it comes to desktop development is preserving investments. Okay. As I said, most Microsoft desktop development technologies have had great continuity and longevity. So if you have been doing WinForms development, the good news is this is not a dead end. If you are doing WPF development, that's not a dead end. The one exception to that is probably Silverlight. Now, a lot of people will say, well, Silverlight was really a web app, uh, web technology. It actually came from the web team within Microsoft. Uh, but in a way, it was a rich client environment, and therefore you could consider it uh, a desktop technology. Uh, so that's the one uh, area that's a little bit different, but everything else you can bring forward very, very easily. And as I said, drastic difference from what you would see on the website. Now, I see there's already questions coming in. Uh, I'll get to those in a little bit uh, as we are going through our presentation here. So let's start approaching this by kind of going through these technologies chronologically. And I want to start this with WinForms. WinForms, in a way, is the granddaddy of the desktop development technologies on .NET. Now, you could go back a little bit further yet and say, well, what about VB6 or, or any of the former VB Windows development technologies that were kind of the inventor of this paradigm of desktop development? Uh, or even things like Visual Fox Pro was also very similar. But, but there's no true continuity there, right? You, you have to convert even though the paradigm is the same and the learning curve is not that hard. But starting with WinForms, even on, on Visual Studio .NET 1.0 back in 2000, back in 1999, so 22 years ago now, wow, an old tech. Uh, but interestingly enough, WinForms is still fully supported today. And not just is it still fully supported, but WinForms is also getting refreshed. And that means as WinForms is getting refreshed, first of all, it's moving onto the new platform. So there is a WinForms on .NET 5, and it actually works quite well. And it also resets the support cycle. So all the long-term support and everything that Microsoft has, the years and years of support, just reset for WinForms. So if you're still doing WinForms development, you may be losing out on some of the more modern technologies or modern um, UI controls and so on. Although even that's not too bad to tell you the truth. Uh, and so, yes, uh, it's actually not a dead end and you can feel somewhat comfortable about that. Okay, so this is still a thing. And when we talk to customers, we see this coming up quite a bit. Uh, a lot of people come to us and say, we have an old WinForms system. It may be, you know, Visual Studio from 10 years ago. What do we do? And the short answer is most of the time, you can just bring that forward and modernize it. And I think to me, that is a hugely important step because as an industry, we just must be past this, this idea of we are throwing out software every few years and, and restart from scratch. So being able to gradually move these things forward and even still continue uh, WinForms as part of the mix is a good thing. Now, I would advise against using WinForms for new projects. I do get that every so often where people say, oh, well, WinForms just seems to be so much easier and, and why don't we go that route? And, and the answer is, well, it is 20 year old technology and there are limitations that you can't just overcome easily. And I'll show you some of those here in a moment. Uh, so when you start something new, 
I would advise against starting it with wind forms and, and I'll show you some other technologies that are probably better suited. But if you are on wind forms, then don't panic, right? Wind forms is still a technology that is definitely suited for your development. Now, I actually want to show you an example of something we are doing internally at EPS <clears throat> where we are still using wind forms. So as you probably know, we are not just a, a software shop, but as Jim said in the intro, we do things like we publish Code Magazine and we have an internal system that we use uh, to manage Code Magazine. So whether it's about coming out with new issues of the magazine, whether it's about customer service, all that type of stuff. Um, and for that, we have a system that's a mixture of things. I've already talked in other Stata.nets and other presentations about our back office system, which is entirely service-based and how we have been able to bring that forward over the years. Uh, and then on the UI side, we have anything from WPF to WinForms apps to web apps of different versions from Blazor to View to Angular and all kinds of stuff, ASP.NET, MVC, of course, and so on. So our system is built out of many things, but the heavy duty system that, for instance, customer service uses is based on a WinForms app. And let me just fire up this app here and uh, let me show to you what this application does. So I'm going to log in here on a different screen. It's going to take a short moment. And here is this application that we are running. Okay, uh, still logging in. So one of the things that's really interesting about this application is I'm currently sitting in my home and I'm running this application from my home across the internet. Why? Because this is an entirely service-driven architecture. Um, and this is still loading, which is unusual, but usually things slow down a little bit when I do my screen sharing. So this is still evaluating rights and here's our application up and running. And let me just switch that over here to a different theme. So we have an application that is, uh, if you want to call it that, a conventional Windows app, except when you look at this, you don't immediately say, oh, wow, this looks old. Instead, you can look at this. It has a, a menu that's more like a universal app. I can come in here and I can uh, do a search. I can go in and I can launch different parts of the app. And you see it, it kind of acts like a modern app. It's multi-threaded. It has a nice grid that's displayed. Oh, uh, you can do things like collapse the menu to get a little more screen real estate. This is actually an app designed for a very large screen. Uh, so it's a little bit difficult for me to show that here in a small one. But the point is, there was a fear at some point that running GDI plus based technology, which is what WinForms is, it's a software rendered UI layer sitting on top of GDI or GDI plus, uh, which means it's running on the CPU, not on a graphics card. Now there was a, a fear that that would just get too slow, that when you run really large screens, high resolution screens, that would get too slow. And I'm happy to report that this hasn't been a problem. It's working perfectly fine, uh, even on a 4K screen at full resolution. So we can go in here and, and we can look for different issues in the magazine. Let's just pop one up. And you see, as I double click that, it pops up a new window, which is of course typical for desktop development. This window also opens up at the location that I last closed it at. So it remembers the window positions. And that's a fairly significant part, actually. We have a lot of customers that name that as one of the number one reasons why they want to go with a Windows desktop app. This is more control over where windows go, how window positions are remembered, the sizing. And yes, you can do a lot of that in a web browser. If you go to a browser app, you can do that too but it doesn't come very natural in a browser app. It's one of those things that, yeah, you can do it, but it certainly isn't the strength of the app. And I think that is a, a key point is comparing these advantages and disadvantages. And this is just an, an advantage of a desktop application is this control over the window positions, right? So, so here is uh, our UI for managing uh, individual issues of a magazine. You, again, you see that this looks pretty modern. We have interesting, UI is in here like this list of things, which most people that do WinForms development probably wouldn't expect the list with photos in it and so on. Uh, but that's a bit of a mis misconception. You can actually do advanced UIs in Windows Forms as well. And, and so here, for instance, the articles that are in this issue, we can double click into one of those and bring up that article. And here you see how we maintain these articles. And there's actually a very rich editing experience in here based on Markdown. 
And again, it's probably something that most people wouldn't associate with WinForms development, but yes, it's absolutely possible to do something like that. Um, you know, we have file attachments in here, all kinds of stuff like that. We can drill into the author of this particular issue. And you'll notice that all these screens come up at a, at a sensible position. And typically what happens is the people that do this stuff in our organizations have multi-monitor systems and they come up, uh, these windows come up on the right monitor. Uh, if they have advanced scenarios where they're looking at multiple articles, they want to edit at the same time, or maybe in customer service, they have multiple things open at the same time, works very well. So this type of control center setup works really well in a Windows desktop app. And for instance, we do another things like we're working with an oil company, oil and gas exploration company, and the geologists have, you know, maybe six uh, monitors open at the same time. They have different views of geologic formations. And for that, a desktop application just, just works quite a bit better than a web app. So, you know, that's one of the other reasons we do that. So again, here is it's kind of an advanced display of uh, what people that subscribe to the magazine. This is an author, but he's also a subscriber. So we can see the issues of the magazine that, that this guy owns and, and various other things about this this uh, uh, particular author here. So anyway, that's just a quick overview. Uh, another thing that's kind of interesting in this application as I'm closing this stuff down again, is we have some theming built in. So I can easily switch to, for instance, a dark theme, which looks kind of cool. Uh, you know, I got also a Slack based theme. Um, and you see that this just all changes on the fly. And that's very cool. Again, it's not something that people would uh, probably associate with the WinForms application. Um, now there's some things that don't work perfectly in here uh, when, it, when it comes to theming. Like for instance, you'll notice that the scroll bar over here is not themed as a dark scroll bar like you would probably expect for this type of a dark theme setup. Uh, and that's because WinForms has some limitations there, right? It's not one of the newer UI technologies that was built for that. And so could we have rethemed the scroll bar? Yes, we could, but overall theming was very easy with this. Theming the scroll bar was not. Uh, it would have you know, made no sense cost-wise to do that. Um, so yeah, we do do custom or customization like that. Like for instance, this grid is actually a grid that we built. It's not a third party uh, component and, and that's very feasible in WinForms. But at some point, it's got to say, well, the trade-off is not worth it. We're not replacing all scroll bars in the system with themed scroll bars. It's just too much. While in other technologies like WPF, that would have been very easy to do. And I'll show you some examples of that as well. Now, a question online that I want to answer right away is, how do we deploy updates to this? We deploy updates to WinForms as well as WPF applications using Click Once. So Click Once is this technology where you can uh, create a deployment, a, a package with a manifest, and you can then deploy that somewhere. And when a new version of the app is available, you can let the WinForms app or the WPF app automatically check for an update and it downloads that update and installs it. And there's kind of a standard way of doing it, which looks a little crappy, but there's also a super simple API that allows you to do a custom job of that and decide exactly when and how it updates. And so that's what we do. It's a trivial operation. It works really, really well. And one of the big news, I can mention that right away. I had that, I think, later in one of my slides. Click Once has been improved for .NET 5. So it'll work well with .NET Core and, and just .NET 5 applications as well. So that's what we use. Works really, really well. We deploy uh, the manifest, the package, uh, the setup file, if you want to think of it like that. We deploy that to Azure and then we get the updates deployed worldwide, because this is an app that's used worldwide. We, we get that from Azure. So, so that's a, another pretty key component. I already mentioned it, but it's worth saying it again. This works from anywhere, right? We, we use this application securely and in a fairly performant manner from around the world. So, so that's pretty cool. And, and again, probably not something that people would expect when we talk about WinForms applications. So, so there you have it. Now let's talk a little bit about developing for this stuff. What is new for WinForms in .NET 5? And the first thing is, well, it works, right? So that's an important thing because in the earlier versions of .NET Core, 
nobody talked about desktop development. It was all about web development. It was all about ASP.NET. It was all about services and stuff like that. It was all about cloud operations. Uh, but since .NET Core 3X, really 3.1, uh, WinForms and WPF are supported as first-class citizens, as, as .NET Core workloads. And now we've moved past .NET Core. We are in .NET 5, which is the continuation of .NET Core. Uh, just we dropped the core of the naming, it's just now .NET 5. Uh, and it's in there as well, and in fact has a number of improvements. And some of the key improvements are better designer support, because that just did not work well in .NET Core 3X. So the ability to design WinForms as well as WPF applications uh, only kind of worked a little bit, some more, some less, but that is now in there and it actually works really well. So that's, that's an important piece. Another important piece that goes overlooked most of the time, because when we talk about things that aren't sexy, well, it really isn't so sexy for most people to talk about Visual Basic. You're never gonna hear about that in a keynote. But to me, that's a pretty significant piece. There now is support for Visual Basic and you can build, in general, .NET 5 apps in Visual Basic, and that includes Visual Basic WinForms applications. Why is that so important? I think it's super important for continuity. If you have an older Visual Basic WinForms app, then how do you bring that forward? Well, now you can because it just works. And you know, would I recommend that you start something new in Visual Basic? Yeah, probably not. The only reason to do that would be that you have skills in Visual Basic. But C Sharp's not that different, it's not that hard to learn. Once you get used to pit putting semicolons and curly brackets, uh, the paradigm is very similar, which makes it relatively easy to learn. And everything that's new is coming out for C Sharp, right? So I would recommend going with C Sharp if you can. But if you have a VB app, you're now in safe hands. And in fact, the app that I just show you, the, showed you that we are running internally is in part a VB app. I mean, it's probably, two thirds C sharp and one third VB and that works fine. So, so I think while it might not be the sexiest announcement that I have today, but it's certainly uh, for enterprises is a huge money saver and investment for servers, this ability to now support Visual Basic 6. And I think there was a question online about that. So we now answered that as well. Um, so there's a question online, does .NET 5 still have support with uh, working with the API? And yes, the answer is yes. And there's actually some improvements around that as well. And you know, don't have anything prepared to go into any details for that, but check that out. .NET 5 is improving the click one story again. So what do you do if you have an old WinForms app that you want to move to .NET 5? Well, it's actually easier than you think, uh, unless, uh, you have very unusual third-party tools that are in there that may not be supported. But generally speaking, it's relatively straightforward to move your old WinForms app to .NET. And in fact, I'm going to show you an example app that I have here. So what I have here is an old WinForms app. I just created this for, for sample purposes and I made it a .NET 4 app. So just to simulate a little bit of an older application. And this is super simple, right? It just has a button that's a folder picker. And all this does is it just brings up a folder browser dialog and then, then puts the result in there, just so we have something to look at. So when I compile this and run it, what we'll see is pretty much exactly what you expect to see. So here it is. So here's our WinForms app. I can click the pick folder dialog and it pops up this folder picker and I can now drill into my folder, my, my computer and uh, whatever, pick a folder and hit okay. And it puts it into this text box here. Okay. Um, so that works fine, but it's an older application. So what could we do to actually convert that into .NET 5 or this whole new .NET Core platform. And without going into too much detail, um, the .NET Core platform or what we now call .NET 5 is a completely new thing, right? And, and if you haven't looked into that, there's some older state of .NET recordings from I think two months back where we talk a lot about that. Uh, so 
under the hood, everything has changed. Everything is modernized. Everything is more efficient, has access uh, to new APIs and SDKs. It's split into smaller pieces so you can deploy more efficiently. Um, and that's what we want to switch to. Now, when you look at what's going on with an older app, one of the things we can do is we can look into the project file. Now, the only way I can do that on this older app is I can say unload my project because Visual Studio has a lock on the project file. And then I can go and edit the project file. And this is the under the hood file. If you've never looked at this, this is essentially a build script that tells Visual Studio how to build this application. And there's lots and lots of stuff in here, even for this tiny app with essentially one source file, right? And that's what makes this project a full .NET project. And that's what we need to change. And we could do that by hand relatively easily, but there's a tool that's called try convert. So we could go, whoops, not into here. We could go into a command line. This over here. And in this command line tool, we could go to our folder And we could now in here trigger this try convert utility. It's it's just you you call it you call try convert you hit enter and this will then go and it will search a potential WinForms or WPF project to convert. Now I'm not going to do that right now because I've already done it ahead of time. I have a second version of this and I want to be able to do this demo multiple times. But that's what I did and this usually takes care of it and performs that conversion task for you. And so I have another project in here, which is my new WinForms project. And in this project, I have exactly the same form. I have exactly the same code in here, but the project structure has changed. And you now it takes usually a moment to open this for the first time because it has to start two different environments communicating from Visual Studio to this new .NET 5 environment for development purposes. And, and that's the one downside. It can sometimes be a little slow, but it's usually just the first time you actually do this. So that gives me an opportunity to take a sip of my morning coffee. Boy, this is really taking long. Could have had the whole cup, I guess. But in any event, the source code of this didn't change, right? The development experience didn't change. And I saw that there is a, a question online about what's new in .NET 5 for WinForms. And, and this is the major news here is that this designer now works well. Um, in terms of actual news under the hood, in WinForms itself, there isn't that much. It's mostly just that it works. That's the big news. But uh, uh, there's other components we can bring in later. I'll talk uh, to you about that over the later parts of this talk. But anyway, here's the code. And this code is exactly the same. But if we now look into the project file, I can just double click this thing. And we see our project file right here. It's not locked anymore. It's actually perfectly possible to edit a .NET 5 project file while the project is open. And you see that this is drastically simplified. It's basically a folder-based approach now. It says the target framework is .NET 5 with Windows extensions. It makes a, a Windows EXE as an output, not a DLL. Uh, and it uses Windows Forms, which brings in all the packages needed to do WinForms development. So that's all the magic here. And if we now make this our startup project, uh, there we go. And uh, just start this. It's now gonna compile this WinForms project with this entirely new platform. Now for us as the developer, it doesn't look that different, but under the hood, a lot of things have changed. Also, when you do this the first time, it would bring in all the packages needed to make this work. Uh, and here is our WinForms application now running on .NET 5. And when I hit that pick folder dialog, you'll see one of the advantages you get in doing that. This folder dialog is a much more di modern dialog than the one I just used. If you think back just two or three minutes, we had that stupid little dialog that's a pain to use. We now have this folder dialog that's much more powerful, much more usable, just a more modern version. And we got that automatically 
by switching to this new .NET 5 platform. And so that's an example of why you want to do that. You just get the newer stuff. You get the newer APIs, the newer SDKs. In a lot of ways, one of the main reasons of doing this is that it gets you out of a dead end because while .NET 4X is still supported and will be supported for a long time, support is not equal to getting new stuff, right? So, so this gets you out of this dead end, gets you on the latest version of all this. And now you can play with the cool kids again with all the modern APIs, Azure Access, all that type of stuff. Um, question online, what version of VS has try convert? Uh, actually, I should have prepared for that. I, I'm not prepared for it. It's a separate download, but I forget. I don't believe it's coming in with Visual Studio in general. So, but just Google try convert. Uh, also, going back to our slide here, uh, we came out with a focus issue. You have a image of it here on a slide. Focus issue for .NET 5. And I'm not trying to sell you something here. This is available for free online. If you go to copemagcom slash focus, you will find this issue, all the contents available for free. There's an entire article just on how to convert your older uh, desktop apps to .NET 5. And it tells you all about the try convert utility. Okay, another question is, does this create a compact exe file? Actually, what I've done right now does not create a compact .exe file. It creates multiple files, but then when you do click once deployment, it packages, packages uh, that up. Now, what's interesting is in .NET 5, you can do what's called a single file deploy. So that would be a compiler switch that I could set, and then it would make a small uh, single file, does some tree shaking on that to, to get rid of everything I didn't use, and just makes a small single file. So that's a very interesting uh, new option you have. Okay, so also a question about third-party controls. Sometimes when you use third-party controls, that might be a reason why the conversion doesn't work, but most of the time it works fine. It depends on what the third-party vendors use. So there's a question about Infragistics or DevX controls. Um, I don't have any specific uh, news to share about either of those, but to my knowledge, they work. So uh, try it out and uh, you you see. Uh, also, is MSIX deployment still a thing? Yes, it is. It's not the default that most people do, and you'd have to actually have a third-party utility for that. Um, but yes, that's still a thing as well. Uh, question is the project directory bloated by packages? In my case, here it is, but if you do that single file deploy, um, then uh, uh, that works. Okay, does .NET 5 run on Windows 7? Yes, it does. Okay. So moving along here, uh, another thing I want to mention is WinForms is now open source, has been for I think about two years. So if you're into open source, you can go to github.com.net slash WinForms and you can see what's going on with that open source project. You can even contribute to that. And it's very much an active and alive and well project. So I would encourage you to check that out. Uh, this is one of the success stories of open source and Microsoft. And, you know, Microsoft's now the biggest contributor to open source. So, so that plays right into that. But let's move along. Let's talk about some other technologies. WPF, the Windows Presentation Foundation. That is the technology that was the successor to WinForms. And it had a number of reasons why that was a good idea. The high-res displays, the improved graphics, the, the rendering, on the graphics card, taking load off the CPU, all those things still apply today and just a more modern, powerful way of doing application development. And this is something that we encounter a lot in the wild. Uh, again, it's not something that a lot of people talk about, it, yet it's something a lot of people do. Uh, it's almost like people are ashamed of still doing this, right? When in reality, a lot of people are. Uh, this to me is currently the way we do Windows desktop application development. Uh, we we kind of use that as a default when a customer comes to us and says they want a new Windows desktop app. It's a powerful technology. It's not restrictive. It gives you the typical Windows feel, not just in terms of what the application is like, but also what the application can do. Because when I build a Windows app, I expect that to be a pretty unrestricted app. I expect to be able to manage the security which I can, but I expect to have the choice 
to access things on my local machines, like folders, like specialty hardware, all that type of stuff. So it's less restrictive than some of the other technologies we'll talk about, like UWP. You can build an app that feels like a real Windows app, just in terms of the look. You have an extreme degree of freedom, what that means. Uh, that could mean an older style app that looks like Windows 95. It could be something that looks like a universal app. It could be a touch enabled app and all kinds of stuff. So it's really powerful and provides a high degree of freedom. Now the question is, is this the right platform for you? Again, we consider this the standard for modern Windows desktop development. Now, a lot of people say, oh, but UWP is the newer platform. And yes, that's true, but it's also a more restrictive platform. And so a little bit of a spoiler here, we don't see that many people using UWP. Uh, and we'll talk about that here in a moment. Now, WPF has a little bit of a bad name for a number of reasons. Uh, one was that it had a little bit of a rocky start in terms of the success that people had with it. It's a super powerful technology. It's actually a pretty straightforward and simple technology once you know the paradigm. It's one of those technologies that has a little bit of a learning curve because it's a paradigm shift. But the nice thing about WPF is once you get into it, it gets pretty easy. Right, so it has a learning curve that I like. It's a it's a hump of getting into new stuff, but it's not one of these technologies that remains hard as time goes on. I sometimes experience that with some of the web frameworks where you you learn everything there's to it, and two years later you're still like, oh, this is a pain. Why is this so hard? Why do I have to jump through all these hoops? WPF is nothing like that. WPF once you get it, it's actually a super productive, straightforward technology, but many of the original architectures that people suggested were not like that. So we have a lot of customers that come to us with WPF apps where it's really difficult to develop this thing. It's really difficult to maintain it over time. We see teams where we have 10 people working on this app and only the, the main architect gets it and all the others, the architect thinks are stupid and, and the other nine feel bad because they can't really function things think they can't keep up with modern development. In reality, it's usually a setup that's way too convoluted. And we've seen that a lot where apps just get in trouble for no real reason and we help them recover and then they're usually doing very well. So when done right, it's, it's very straightforward. And it's the desktop technology that probably has more features than anyone else. And let me just fire up a, a quick example here for you. This is simply an example application let me move it over from my secondary screen here. So here's this application. And this is an app that we built as a sample. It's actually my test bench for technology. It's a sample that we built using code framework for WPF, which is our internal framework. It's open source. It's free. You can, you can have a lot of people use that. Uh, but it's just a representative thing for WPF development. And there's actually quite a few articles we have online. And then feel free to ping me about this. Uh, as to how you do productive WPF development. And so what we have in this example, this is a, a sample that plays on our magazine management uh, uh, backstory here. So we have an, an app that just simulates managing a list of magazines or uh, looking at a list of subscribers and it just makes up fake data. This, this is the sample app from Code Framework. And you see, this looks very much like a Windows app with a toolbar and a menu up here. Um, but then the cool thing about this is we can switch this into different themes. And you've already seen me theme switching in the WinForms app where the colors changed. And that's typically what you do in theme switching in most desktop apps. It's just a, like Visual Studio itself, for instance, you can switch the theme and it just changes the colors. But watch what happens when I switch into what we call the workplace theme here. It just like this switches over and all of a sudden it looks like office. Now this means not just colors change, but we now have a ribbon. Uh, the arrangement of the windows changed a little bit. We're still having them posted here in a tab fashion. Oh, but it certainly changed how these UIs are hosted. Now we can also open new windows and so on. It's still a desktop app. Now check this out. I have the zoom slider here. And this does what we call an intelligent zoom of the application. So for instance, every piece of content in here just zoom perfectly fine and the layout got preserved and it just works. But we can, we can do the zoom operation 
And it, this took practically no development. It's, it's one zoom slider control that we put into a style and it just works. Now we zoom intelligently in the sense that the ribbon didn't just got bigger. Now it could have gotten bigger if we chose to do so, but it's just an example of where we can selectively zoom the parts of the application that make sense. So very cool. And this is something that I just couldn't do like this in WinForms. It'd be super hard in WinForms and it wouldn't work for all controls. All right, so that's a cool thing we can do. Now uh, I can switch into different types of, of themed apps. Like here's one that's a black theme because most people like these black themes. And as you see, this just didn't change the colors. Again, it changed the structure of the app and it also changed the way this list works here by showing these preview images of these individual magazines that we have. Uh, let's go pick uh, one or two more. Let's go into the universe theme. Universe is more like a Windows 10 universal app, right? Where we have uh, something that looks more like that and it has a fly out hamburger menu. And again, this is just the live app that does this while this is up and running. It's just applying it on the fly, even though there's drastic um, structure changes. I can even go into these older style Metro apps where we have something like this here. And you can see we got a tile-based UI. Um, you can probably not see me do this, but I'm now touching my screen with my finger. So we have uh, a touch screen support that's really working well. You see that the live tiles are animated. I can go into my subscriber list and I don't have any photos of people, but you can see that we still use this live tile approach here. And so the point I'm making is we are switching between drastically different styles of this application on the fly. We're doing very advanced UI things. And the cool part is this is super easy. Let me just show you real quick what the code is that goes along with that. Here is the code that makes for this um, list of subscribers that I just showed you. So what we're doing here is we're defining a view, essentially a window and this window has a list box, which is our list of, uh, in this case, subscribers. It's a simple styled list box, similar to how you would style it perhaps in HTML. And then down here is we have these controls that make up the search UI where I can put in first name, last name, and so on. And so that just works. That's it, right? These few lines of code are what makes this UI. And that's one of my big things about WPF development is it's if you do it right like this, it is A, super productive and B, super flexible because you're not hard coding that many things. Now, most people doing WPF development, I realize this is not the experience they get. The, the architectures they chose are usually hard. And there's a question online uh, where somebody asks, can you call out examples of bad architecture? And there's several frameworks I can think of now in the interest of diplomacy, I don't wanna call them out. Uh, but we made code framework specifically to fix some of that. I was involved earlier on the Microsoft side in developing some of those other frameworks and spinning them off to the public domain. Again, I don't want to call them out, but, uh, but the frameworks that are different is a hours. And again, I'm not trying to sell you something. It's just some we use internally and we make it available as open source. Um, and then there's also MVVM Lite that is a much more lightweight and streamlined and straightforward uh, architecture. Um, question line, does WPF have a file and folder browser? Actually, very good question. First of all, the answer is A, yes, it does have a file and folder browser, but B, this is not a, an island of a technology. This is, it still functions in the overall .NET framework. So you can still use, say, WinForms dialogs. You can even host WinForms controls in here if you were so inclined. In fact, you can go the opposite route. You can host WPF controls in WinForms. You're gonna lose some of the, the features like the scaling, but that's possible. That mixing and matching is, is a very important thing to understand. Uh, does this WPF sample app use any other helper frameworks like Prism is a question online? No, it does not. This is just using code framework. And in fact, it's using code framework almost as a sample of how to do things. And we have some article that explain how to do the same stuff even without code framework and set your app uh, uh, up nicely. Okay, there's several other questions. I'll get to them uh, in a moment. But anyway, so is WPF right for you? I think in a lot of uh, scenarios, the answer to that is, is yes, it is. If you want to do desktop development. So for us, it very often is 
do I want to do web or do I want to do WPF? So that's uh, the story there. Now, WPF is an open source effort similar to WinForms, uh, github.com slash .net slash WPF. This is not a success story so far. In fact, this is the least like open source project that Microsoft has when they evaluate that. Um, that is mainly due to a short staffing of the WPF team. In fact, they have been trying to scramble for more people and they have promised to make this open source project better. So I think that's well underway and there's hope there. But mainly due to the pandemic, I think they have had trouble hiring the people they wanted and therefore just don't have enough people to respond to pull requests and stuff like that. So let's hope that'll get better. But again, it is available as open source, which is pretty cool. Uh, question online is, if, uh, is it better to invest in click once, which by the way, we also click once deploy WPF apps as well as WinForms apps, um, in case you have custom deployment tools in place. Well, if you like your custom deployment tools, use them, right? Uh, click once, uh, use it if you find it to be beneficial. But if you have something in place that you like better, then use that. Now, I don't know what your custom deployment tools are, um, um, but uh, you know, if you like them, use them. Uh, question, uh, uh, another question online is, does WPF have a WYSIWYG designer like WinForms does? Yes, both of them support WYSIWYG design in .NET 5. Now, for the larger projects we do, we tend to not use the WPF WYSIWYG designer because it usually creates very large amounts of SAML code and we kind of get to, to a cleaner result if you don't use it. But if you enjoy using it, then absolutely it's available there for you. So moving along, moving along, let's talk about some of the other options. Uh, the universal app platform, UWA, Universal Windows Apps, or UWP, the Universal Windows Platform, is certainly a choice we have. Uh, those are what we would often refer to as Windows 10 apps. In fact, their name has changed over time. They started in Windows 8 as, as the Metro apps, totally unloved. Uh, they then went to Windows Store apps. Now we're calling them universal apps or just Windows apps. All the same thing as a continuation of that. And it's actually a really good platform. I like a lot of the things that happen in UWP. Um, now UWP is supposed to be universal, which means runs on Windows 10, runs on Xbox, runs on HoloLens, runs on Windows forms, uh, Windows phones, excuse me. And, and that is cool if you have those scenarios. Now, who still targets Windows phones? Nobody, right? Like when, when that went away, to me, that removed a lot of the appeal of UWP apps. Because this idea of building an app that, that runs on the phone, but when you plug the phone into a monitor, it appears on the monitor, great, right? But that went away. So now you're building basically apps that run in Windows 10. Maybe some of you have the need to run in things like Xbox or HoloLens or even other devices that run Windows 10, then UWP is your way to go. Now, if I'm to build just a Windows desktop app, do I have a strong reason to go to UWP? Honestly, I'd be hard pressed to come up with a reason for that. Now, it has some cool controls, but those controls you can now also use in WPF and even WinForms. We'll talk about that in a moment. So it's great technology that comes out of this platform, but uh, I would only use it if I have a real reason to, to tell you the, the honest truth. And we don't have that many customers that build on the, the UWP platform. Uh, we've made a huge investment in that. We have a lot of skills for that. Uh, and there are some scenarios where it's really good. Like if you really want to deploy it through a good experience in the Windows Store, great. Um, but unless you have those special reasons, my personal opinion and what I see in the marketplace is you would be better off doing WPF and perhaps bringing in some of the UWP controls into your WPF or even WinForms experience because you get a lot of those benefits out of that. Fundamentally, UWA is a continuation of WPF. So it uses the same technologies. It's a little bit simplified in some ways. It's more powerful in others, in, in especially in the sense that it has existing controls you can use that just out of the box make things look good and flow nice and got this fluid UI concept, but, but that's what it is there. So I'm not gonna show you any samples of UWA because frankly, it just hasn't been a big enough deal in the real world. Let's talk about WinUI briefly. Now this is where things get a little confusing to a lot of people. What is WinUI? WinUI is a set of controls 
that are very useful for building desktop application. And there's actually a sample app in the Windows Store for WinUI controls. But the short version is a lot of these things that you see in modern Windows apps, like if I bring up, for instance, uh, the weather app. Here's the weather app. That's a typical UWP application. And, uh, you know, it has the typical controls and you see everything is animated and, and we can go to different things. And again, it's very fluent and so forth. That is what a typical UWP application that uses WinUI uh, looks like. And you can get a lot of that by simply using this WinUI controls library. It's a library that sits on top of formerly UWP and now with WinUI 3, which is about to be released in March and is available as a preview version, you can target just about any desktop app. Um, so in the past, that was kind of possible through this thing called SAML Islands, that was well, worked well, uh, but it had to take these extra steps. Now with WinUI 3, it's actually very easy to do that. You can just bring it into your WinForms app. You can bring it into your Windows, uh, into your WPF app. You can even do some other things like the, if you're a C++ guy, you can bring it into an MFC app. We're not talking about MFC today because we're talking about .NET, but that's also possible. So that's very cool. And, and in a sense, that is where UWP and everything sitting on top of it becomes very cool because it now plays into everything else. Uh, so I encourage you to look that out and just extend your WPF and your WinForms. And if you have a UWP app, great, it works there too. But that's what WinUI is. It's a, a library that sits on top of those uh, other technologies. And it's actually coming from the Windows team internally, I believe, not from the .NET team. Another thing that comes from another team is what we know as WebView 2. What is WebView 2? WebView 2 is essentially the Microsoft Edge browser, the new Edge browser, that's Chromium-based Edge browser, in a control. So it is a super modern browser that's essentially the same as Chrome from Google and many other browsers. So it's a, a totally compatible browser engine. Side note, Microsoft Edge is a really cool browser that is very fast adopted. Um, so that browser now runs inside your app. And, you know, some of the things that I showed you in even back in that WinForms app where we did the article editing and it showed a preview of the article, that's the edge control. Um, so the very cool stuff, it can be integrated into any desktop development environment and it's easier to use than Chromium. In the past, we embedded Chromium. That was a huge additional deployment. You also had to choose certain app models in your .NET app so it would actually work, certain uh, processor architecture and so on. And that sometimes was a problem because it may not be uh, in sync with some of the other things you need to do. That's all gone. WebView 2 just works. So I highly recommend you use that. Um, very cool new thing that's available. Uh, so question online, um, is the current implementation of WPF only using .NET 5, or are you still supporting WPF in the old .NET framework? The old one is also still supported, absolutely. Now, there's usually questions I get, I get about this thing called Project Reunion, which is yet another one of those projects Microsoft has for desktop development. What is this thing? Well, it's actually what I just showed you. Project Reunion is just this umbrella term for Microsoft trying to reunify a lot of these desktop technologies. So the fact that WinUI 3 isn't just UWP, but it also runs on WinForms and WPF and all of those uh, is one of the first concrete things that's coming out of Project Reunion. The same is true for WinUI 3. So just, just so you know, when somebody talks about it, it's just that other stuff. Now that um, in a way wraps up on a quick question here online. Can WebView 2 be used in WinForms? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so that wraps up kind of the conventional Windows development technologies that we have coming out of the .NET platform. I want to briefly mention, guess it's not totally fitting into today's presentation, but I want to briefly mention Electron. What is Electron? Electron is essentially a hybrid app that is an uh, app model that is used to build desktop application. It's wrapping Google Chrome or Chromium, the Chromium engine, into a Windows wrapper that can then be installed as a desktop application. This is an effort that came originally from GitHub. GitHub built this because they wanted to build a desktop app that was their GitHub client app. 
Um, and so they built this electron thing, which then became popular and people building desktop applications with it, but you build these desktop applications by using web technology. So whatever renders inside of that window is in fact HTML and JavaScript and they're hosting node.js um, and, and HTML and so on. Now they're also extending the model a little bit so you have access to more things on the machine than you would normally use. So it's a, a cool thing to do if you want to take the HTML approach for building desktop apps. If you already have HTML skills, that's a great way to go. You don't have to learn the usually more difficult or at least for web developer, apparently more difficult Windows development story where you would have to learn all these other things. Uh, it's also cross-platform and that's really cool. Right, so you can build uh, this Electron-based application and you can deploy it to a Mac, for instance, right? Because it's at the end of the day, it's just a web technology. Now, this is, like I said, originally a GitHub uh, initiative. It's open source, but it's owned by GitHub. Well, Microsoft has bought GitHub a while back. Therefore, this is now a technology owned by Microsoft. So it's another Microsoft desktop development technology. Uh, kind of interesting that it went that way. Now, how much is Electron used? Well, it has a lot of hype. It also has some of the, some very high profile apps like Visual Studio Code is built on Electron. Microsoft Teams is built on Electron. Uh, lots and lots of apps that are out there of that nature are built in Electron. Now, when it comes to how many clients do I see built Electron apps in-house for like an enterprise system, it's actually less than you would think. And uh, some research has been done around how many Electron apps are there in the wild. Um, and it's mostly those apps uh, like an Evernote or like a Slack or uh, these types of apps that are built with it, but not as many in-house apps, surprisingly. So that's an interesting tidbit to know. Now, here is something that I wanna tell you about. Uh, this is an effort that we have been involved with. Uh, it's an open source effort called Fotino, originated in something called Web Window, which originated also with Microsoft, and they handed it over to, to the community, and we've uh, decided to take a lead in that. Fotino is similar to Electron, but it's a more modern version. It's built on the Edge Chromium engine, so it's a more modern browser that's in there. Its goal is to tie better into .NET, uh, its goal is to extend it over time. So you have much more controls over things like window creation. So when I told you that we have all these customers that are really interested in controlling the window environment more and multi-screen and all that type of stuff, well, it's a goal to make Fotino do that as well and, and plug that hole. Uh, so this can be used for building desktop applications that are typical business apps with data entry and, and anything I've shown you today, you should be able to also build in Fotino with web technologies. So if that appeals to you, that might be a very good alternative to Electron. Now, let me have my uh, good friend and coworker, Otto Dobritzberger chime in here because he is one of the brains behind Fotino along uh, with some other people we have. Um, and uh, so Otto, let me hand it over to you and show people a little bit about Fotino. All right, thank you, Marcus. Yeah, let's talk about Fotino real quick. Uh, Fotino, what it is, uh, what you can use it for. I'd like to give you a glimpse of what this effort is that we've been working on for a few weeks now. Um, before we start, I wanna mention that our official launch date for Fotino is March 10th. So on March 10th, we have the Code Presents event where we officially launch Fotino in all its glory, all the uh, code samples will be available. All the code base, since it's open source, will be available. All the uh, uh, Visual Studio extensions and templates will be available. The website and the documentation will all be completely updated and so on. So on March 10th is the official launch date of Fotino. Nevertheless, I'd like to give you a little bit of a preview of what is to come. Maybe get uh, one or the other if you're excited for it and uh, join us on this event on March 10th. Now, what is Fotino? It's a technology that uh, we've been working on that will allow you to create desktop applications using web technologies. So you can use uh, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript in order to create native applications that will run on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux alike. 
Um, you can also use more sophisticated frameworks in that effort. So if you say, hey, you're a React developer, or Angular developer, or you would like to do it in Blazor, no problem at all as well. You can even do uh, 3D applications like games in uh, Fortino and have a little sample for that as well. Now, why are we doing this? What is the background behind it? Uh, some of you might be familiar with alternatives like uh, Electron, for instance. Uh, a lot of the applications that we all use on an everyday basis uh, are based on Electron. And what we have seen and encountered is that uh, a lot of these apps just have a uh, significant size, both in uh, download and memory consumption when you use it. And it didn't, sometimes doesn't feel proportionate to what the app actually is doing. So what we want to provide is a very, very lightweight alternative to it where we really only uh, have the resources um, or use the resources that we need for our application. Now, I mentioned that Fotino is open source and uh, it is layered in multiple tiers uh, of projects. Uh, we have, for instance, at the very bottom, we have the Fotino.native project, which is a C++ or Objective-C uh, project uh, that wraps around the operating systems built in Chromium or WebKit-based uh, browser. Uh, and then that is what we use in our application for the display of our UI. So for instance, on Windows, this means that the WebView 2 control uh, which is based on Chromium Edge, is what's going to be responsible for displaying the web UI in our native desktop application. Uh, the Fotino.native uh, project is compiled for each platform individually and distributed as a NuGet package. So if you just want to get started with Fotino and uh, build applications and uh, don't worry about the low-level uh, base of what's happening there, you don't have to, right? This is can be consumed as a NuGet package in projects. Fotino, as I said, is very lightweight uh, because uh, of a few things. Uh, for instance, the uh, browser control that we use is usually already installed on the operating systems where, that run Fotino. Um, it also is, the wrapper is also based on .NET 5, which means if .NET 5 is already installed on the system, it doesn't have to be included in the deployment uh, that will significantly reduce the size of our applications. The next layer in this hierarchy is Fotino.net, which wraps around the native uh, project. And that makes Fotino available to any and all .NET developers. So if you look at the hierarchy in this uh, picture, for instance, you can see Fotino.native is the core, so to say, of this project. Then we have the .NET wrapper for .NET applications, for instance, for Blazor applications. But at the same time, somebody could say, hey, I would like to generate a wrapper for Rust applications that wraps this Fotino native uh, control and suddenly Fotino will be available for uh, Rust applications as well. Uh, there's a lot of other uh, projects that are dependent on the individual parts of this hierarchy. For instance, we have Fortino test project and sample projects. We have uh, Visual Studio templates and extensions that will facilitate the entry point to create Fotino projects and so on, all this will be released on March 10th uh, to you know, make it easy for people to get into development and get started. Now, what can you build with Fotino? Uh, well, anything really that uh, you can think of with any of the web frameworks that you would like to use. If you are a React developer, you can create your regular React project, for instance, and just make it a Fotino app. Same thing goes for Angular, same thing goes for Vue. If you want to create games, uh, you can use the 3.js framework to create games that are then deployed as Fotino apps at the same time for all three operating systems and work on all three operating systems alike. Uh, when we compare ourselves to Electron, there's a few things that, you know, stand out. So for instance, the download size is significantly smaller in Fortino than it is in uh, Electron. We do not have uh, Node.js as part of our application. We do not have to require .NET 5 uh, to be part of the deployment if it's already installed on the operating system. That difference in size is huge. Um, also, the memory consumption is significantly smaller uh, in Fortino than it is in comparable electron application. Where can you get more info? Well, we have our official website, trifotino.io. 
Uh, we have our GitHub repo, uh, github.com slash trifotino. We have our documentation website as well. Uh, all of this is already available, not to 100% yet. So there's a few things that are not up uh, to date on these websites or on the GitHub repo might not be made available yet because like I said, on March 10th is the official launch date for Fortino. Um, so with that, before I give it back to Marcus, I just wanna give you a little demo so you can see Fortino in action. Uh, so let's do a web application. Let's do this one. If you, for instance, say I would like to do a view application, I can make this my startup project. And uh, when you, you know, go to our repos and get the sample projects, you can get that yourself. And uh, when you start up the view app, you can see our view start screen is hosted inside of a native Windows uh, window and runs our Fortino application in here. Now, if you say, here, I would like to do something else. Maybe you want to do a, a Blazor application, right? Uh, in these samples, I'm going to set this as my startup and I'm going to run my Blazor application and it will create a Fotino window that hosts our Blazor application inside of it. Uh, and it, you know, pertains all its dynamics, you know, the Blazor application uh, adjusts to the window size. It works just like any other Blazor application that, you know, you come across. Development is identical. It's just the deployment is different. Instead of deploying it as a web application, we deploy it inside our Fortino wrapper. And this app will now run on Mac, on Windows, and on Linux uh, at the same time. I also mentioned that we can do something like uh, 2D, 3D games, right? With uh, the 3JS framework. Uh, so we also have a sample for that. If I run my uh, 3D sample app, for instance, it spins up a Fortino window and renders our sample in here where we have this 3D structure that's spinning and turning with the uh, Fortino uh, word up here. And since this is a 3D application, I also have the ability to move around in 3D space and look at this from different angles uh, and can use this as a starting point to create my you know, 3D application, uh, that you know, 3D game if you want, and deploy that then as a Windows game, Mac game, and a Linux game at the same time. So very, very convenient in that sense. Uh, I think that's uh, all I want to show as a preview. I don't want to give away too much. Uh, I hope to see some of you on March 10th for our launch event uh, under the code presents. And uh, yeah, thank you for your time. And I'm um, giving it back to you, Marcus. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dobertsberger. So very cool stuff there. Um, cool stuff with the 3D things. Uh, I think that's a very good example of how you can do something that's really performant in the browser it probably doesn't stream that well over youtube but uh, the point being that that's all very very fast very powerful tech of course i'm assuming that if you in this talk you're not necessarily a game developer or a 3d developer but that's just a sample right uh, most potino apps are probably gonna be uh, typical desktop business applications with data entry fields and so on but so so very cool um anyway move along here and let's take a quick peek into the future. And again, Microsoft is doing an event tomorrow uh, under the .NET Conf brand where they'll talk a lot more about a lot of this stuff, but I'll give you a quick peek over what we already know. And one of those things that's interesting is Project Maui. And I love that name because I happen to live in Hawaii and I live on Maui. And in fact, I put up a photo here of something that's usually the stereotypical Maui shot that's just around the corner from here. So I love, the, I love the code name, but it's actually not even just the code name. It stands for Microsoft uh, Multi-Platform Application UI. And what this is, is it's a continuation of Xamarin Forms. So if you've done any mobile development on the Microsoft platform, you're probably familiar with Xamarin. Xamarin Forms is this product that runs cross-platform iOS, Android, Mac, uh, technically also on other things like UWP, but they never made a big deal about that. Well, Maui is a re-engineering effort of all of that, where they create this new application user interface layer that runs cross-platform and targets things like Windows, uh, especially Windows 10 better. So you're building essentially UWP apps, 
you're using things like uh, all the project reunion stuff. So you're using things like WinUI 3. Uh, it's a very modern, powerful uh, UI layer. And it runs cross-platform, so you can target uh, Mac, you can target iOS and Android. Not in its first iteration Linux. Uh, that may come later. We'll have to see what Microsoft announces there, but it's not expected in the first version. But then, you know, Linux not a typical target for desktop apps anyway. But so Mac, iOS, and Android, in addition to Windows, is really cool. And so this could become a really interesting cross-platform development environment. If you like that San Marino approach, if you like the UWP approach, then that certainly may become a very interesting technology. So we are having an eye on that. We'll certainly make an investment into that as a company, be able to serve our customers with that. How much of a, how much traction it will get is, is a slightly different question. We'll, we'll see that in the .NET 6 timeframe, okay? Uh, and when you build a cross-platform app like that, uh, still Xamarin, right? So you still have access to the underlying components. If you're building for the Mac, there's a way to get to Mac-specific things as well, so the native stuff. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, it's not the topic of today's talk, but Xamarin is also not this separate thing anymore in the .NET 5, .NET 6 timeframe. It's really based on, dot, on top of .NET 5. It's all been unified into this one .NET. I talk about that in our .NET 5 presentation. Uh, you can watch that recording, um, but that certainly falls under that. I see there's a question coming up right now. Is it based on .NET 5 or Mono? It's actually based on .NET 5 or .NET 6, I should say. Okay, so that's Maui. The quick preview, we'll probably do a state of .NET on that once we are getting closer to being able to try out the uh, that technology and have more experience with it. It's so a question online, is Xamarin one of the best ways to take a WinForms app to the web? Well, I wouldn't quite state it like that. If you have a WinForms app and you want to go to the web, you're rewriting, right? So whether you're rewriting with Xamarin or whether you're rewriting in some other way, uh, you're rewriting. And Xamarin actually doesn't take you to the web. It takes you to another desktop version, right? So maybe Blazor might be better maybe even a client-side web technology. So it depends on your exact scenario. We could take a look at that, okay? But it's certainly not some automatic way. And there was a question earlier uh, that I might as well answer right now, and that is, does WPF run on anything but Windows? No, it does not. WPF is a Windows-specific technology. It ties into the underlying hardcore rendering layers of Windows. It's actually one of the things is that it's very performant in how it renders because it uses the Windows graphics hardware and direct X for rendering, but that's only available on Windows. So that won't transfer anywhere else. But anyway, that's Maui. Again, we'll probably talk about that later. Really difficult to say at this point is, you know, how much traction is that gonna get? Is it gonna be a huge thing? Is it more a niche thing? We'll, we'll see, we'll, we'll report back to you on that once we know more about that. Now, another thing that I want to mention briefly that was just announced, is Blazor Desktop. So Blazor, of course, is this new web development environment that Microsoft has come out with, where you can do either server-side development or client-side development, where you can actually run C-sharp code on top of this, this web standard. It's not a Microsoft-specific thing. It's a web standard called WebAssembly. And in WebAssembly, you can actually run C-sharp code as well as other things that are compiled almost natively. So it's a very interesting model. It was originally made available for the browser, very popular. And now Microsoft's taking the next step and making desktop development available like that. Uh, so again, uh, stay tuned for .NET Conf tomorrow. I'll probably talk more about that. The main idea there is to take the Blazor programming model and leverage it for desktop development and use things like what the Maui guys are already doing, like what the WinUI guys are doing. So it's it's going to be a very tightly integrated desktop app is the way I understand that because it's using all those technologies. Some people also ask us, well, what's the difference between Fotino and Blazor desktop? Because Fotino plays really well with Blazor, but we are still more focused on taking that cross-platform web technology approach while Blazor desktop is more interested in integrating things like WinUI into this Blazor model for desktop development. So a little bit different scenarios. Uh, but both are potentially interesting options. 
Um, question online is, will Maui replace uh, WPF? Uh, I guess it's an interesting question at this point, right? It, it may certainly be the next generation that becomes very popular, but it's also more a question, do you buy into the UWP approach? Do you need cross-platform or do you really want more full Windows power unlimited uh, access with security then being put on top of it. So different, slightly different paradigm and we'll see what people like. Like I said, UWP hasn't been setting the world on fire so far. So we'll see how that goes. Another question is, is it Windows 10 only? Uh, it's not Windows 10 only. It's cross-platform in the sense that you can go to Mac and so on. But we'll have to see what happens whether it'll work on Windows 7, I don't have the answer at that point. And that might just be something I may have missed, but my understanding is that it will be Windows 10. But look that up for yourself. I'm not 100% sure in an answer, I have to admit. All right, and that pretty much brings us to the end of today's presentation. Didn't keep my promise, I did go over again. Um, but uh, wrapping it up, I have a few other announcements. I wanna repeat what Jim said in the beginning. There's a survey. You could do us a huge favor by filling that out uh, because it helps us determine what you like, what future data.net topic should be. Really the last half a year has been driven largely by that, knowing what people want to hear about. So if you fill that out, does us a huge favor, plus we're giving away an Amazon gift certificate with it. Um, again, if you're now looking at that and like, hmm, this is all cool stuff, but I have this old WinForms app and I wonder, could I use WinUI? How does that, you know, or, or any scenario like that where you're wondering how that applies to you, feel free to give us a call, contact Jim uh, or the info at codemac.com uh, address and we'll schedule you a free hour of consulting, no strings attached, no need to put down a credit card, anything like that. It has been a popular initiative. So first come, first serve. And, uh, and we'll try to schedule you in as soon as possible. Also check out our Code mobile app. Uh, this has been around for a while now. Right now we make all our Code Magazine content for free available on that mobile app. So check that out, tell your friends about it. It's a cool initiative. We'll keep that until we're through this coronavirus crisis. We'll keep all our content for free. We made that pledge, so, so check that out. Um, if you're a Microsoft customer, whether that's a VSS subscriber, Dev Essentials, what used to be called MSDN subscriptions, you have free access to Code Magazine, courtesy of Microsoft. So again, if you don't have that, tell your friends. Uh, it's a cool thing. I'm not trying to sell you any, it's all free, this stuff is so cool stuff. Now we already have on our calendar, our next data.net event, uh, as always last Wednesday of the month. Uh, this one will be quite interesting. State of DevOps, uh, quest, a, a topic that's been requested a lot in surveys. So that'll be very interesting. Looking forward to that. And then in fact, we have the next one already laid out for April. We'll, re we'll, we'll swing back around to seeing what the latest is around uh, the Azure Cloud Initiative at Microsoft. And again, tomorrow is another .NET Conf day. Uh, just log on .netconf.net. Ironically, and this wasn't planned that way, we had actually our desktop event scheduled before, but Microsoft's also focusing on desktop development and we expect lots of announcements around Maui, around Blazor desktop and so on, as well as WinUI and other things that you heard here today. So, so check that out as well. And with that, uh, I'm closing the main part of this presentation. Now I still have a bunch of questions that have gone unanswered. Um, and, uh, and I'll still answer those, but for the main part, thank you very much for attending. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to make sure that you get all the updates. I know a lot of people are watching these events after they've been, uh, live events. So we do make all the recordings available. So subscribe to that to make sure you're not missing anything. Thank you very much. And I'll get to answering a lot of the question questions right now. The question, uh, let's go from bottom up here, Blazor versus WPF. Well, conventional Blazor is a web technology. That's so HTML in a browser. Um, WPF is, is a Windows technology. So you have completely different tech. You have different security models, different access scenarios, different controls. Uh, with Blazor desktop, those lines might get blurrier because you can use Windows controls. 
at that point. Uh, but still, it's a, a desktop, native desktop versus uh, hybrid app approach. Uh, question, how does Maui compare against Project uh, Uno? Honestly, I don't have that much knowledge about Project Uno, so I'm probably not qualified to answer that question. Um, if somebody has an existing Blazor app, what steps would they use to convert it to a desktop? Well, I'm assuming you're talking Blazor desktop, and that remains to be seen. Maybe Microsoft will announce some stuff tomorrow. My expectation certainly will be that that would be pretty straightforward. Uh, another option would be that you could also go to Fotino, and Fotino would certainly make that scenario uh, work really well. Uh, will Maui work for desktop apps? Yes, that's the whole point of Maui. Uh, any plan, somebody asks, to unify all those uh, before mentioned desktop technology soon so we don't have to learn and keep up with this mess, basically? Uh, and well, the answer is Project Reunion. Microsoft is trying to make sure that all these desktop technologies work across all the platforms, right? So you don't have to make the choice between UWP and WPF because you want the WinUI controls or Blazor Desktop versus Maui. Yeah. All of those should be able to share the same controls. But fundamentally, we have this mess. Uh, so how will this go in the future? I mean, a reunification initiative is underway, obviously, but how much that's gonna be unified back? I still expect WinForms, WPF, and then Maui, Blazor, all those apps to be out there in the wild and continue to do so for a long time. I don't expect that, say, an old WinForms app, you'll just be able to convert to Maui and now it's all under Maui or anything, any of the technologies, right? They're just two different in paradigm, but it's nice to be able to mix and match and, and, and essentially not have to choose. That old WinForms app that we modernized recently that I showed you in the beginning, it uses several of those modern controls and it's a gradual move into the newer controls and that works really well but yeah in terms of the learning curve it's a mess there's no question about it uh, as a question what kind of components are there in WinUI 3 and the easiest way to take a look at that is let me see if i have that up here There is a, it's called the SAML Controls Gallery app. You can download that from the store. And that is a demo app showing off all these WinUI controls. And so you can, can look through this and you can say, okay, for layout, for instance, what's available? And, and there's all these different controls that they show you. And what's cool about these controls is most of them have really good fundamental behavior built in. So uh, let's go to the motion category, for instance. So for instance, when you have uh, something, you know, layout like this, you can navigate forward and backwards and you see, I hope you can see this well over the streaming, that it has UI animations built in. So this fluid, fluid UI that Microsoft has been pushing a lot. And so you can go through this and, and you can see all these different controls. It's a, it's a pretty good example of what you can do. And again, these are usable in all kinds of desktop applications these days. Uh, going further up, I think. There's a question about SQL Server file stream. Honestly, I don't have the answer for that. I'm not a SQL specialist, but send us an email because we have plenty of SQL specialists on staff. We can get you that answer. Is it possible to inject into WinPE, somebody asks. Um, I don't know what that is exactly. Question is, uh, if your app is a mix of WinForms and WPF, can you con convert to .NET 5 the same way? The answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, doesn't really matter whether you have WinForms or WPF. Uh, Somebody is asking out of curiosity, what technologies did we use for our Code Magazine mobile app? We actually wrote two native apps, one using Swift for iOS, and the other using Java for Android, using the Android SDK. 
in hindsight, might it might Samarin have been a good choice? Uh, we were a little worried about the reading experience. We wanted to make sure the reading experience was top notch and we'd have full control over it. So we might still do it the same way, but I would probably also give Samarin a try. I think Samarin is, is also a good choice for that. Were questions, would moving an app from .NET 4.5 to 5 improve the performance? The answer is yes, it might very well be because the way the deployment works, it's just more lightweight. You probably don't carry as long as much baggage. So my expectation would be that it would probably be better, especially .NET 5 performs has performance improvements even over .NET the Core 3.1. So my knee-jerk reaction would be that yes, it should improve performance but it depends a lot on your specific scenario. And so there's another question here uh, where somebody says, yes, this is important stuff. Uh, and in my personal opinion, is WPF still worth to work with or pick migrate to another tech? Honestly, we build a lot of WPF apps on the Windows platform. It's our default choice at this point. We, the more modern technology right now would be UWP. We don't see a lot of demand for that. Uh, therefore, WPF is a good choice. WPF gives us more freedom. We can bring in UWP controls when we want it to. So for us, WPF is a good default choice if you want to do native Windows development. Now, of course, the web versions like Fotino and Electron and all of that is an interesting alternative for people that enjoy that type of tech better and want the cross-platform stuff. And maybe Maui and... Uh, uh, Blazor desktop will become that in the future. But right now, when we start a new Windows project, when a customer specifically asks us to go with the Windows technology, the one I would recommend because of freedom of what you can do, because the powerful nature of it, also because how productive you can be, is I would recommend WPF. Uh, will we update Code Framework? That's a very good question. We have been... Uh, slacking, let's say, in updating the public version of Code Framework. We have, however, actively developed Code Framework and we have internal builds and we make those builds available to people that ask for it. And yes, we are updating the documentation. In fact, if you look at the documentation online, you look at the change log, you can actually see the things we're working on. We have been updating that and we are updating the docs on a fairly regular basis. Now, docs is the typical thing. You can never have uh, enough documentation because it's always the thing you look for is probably not documented well. But feel free to contact us because it is under active development. So we, like I said, Code Framework is something that we don't sell. It's something that we use internally. It's very useful for us. It makes us very productive. And if people want to use it, we're more than happy to share it. Um, so, But it's not a product we are selling. We are supporting it but it's not something that we are pushing uh, as such, which is why we haven't done a lot of public build. Uh, question about chase and advantages. There are in .NET 5 over previous versions of .NET. Well, in .NET Core 3.1, I believe, 3.0, I forget, um, Microsoft replaced uh, or made its own JSON parser. Uh, so rather than using JSON.NET from Newtonsoft, uh, we now have a JSON parser and, and serializer in the system.txt namespace. So that's new. It's actually, you know, they hired the guy who did the JSON.net basically. And in .NET 5, the news is performance improvements there. Can try convert handle entity framework projects is a question. Uh, well, what it does is it really just changes the project structure and checks for incompatibility. So I don't think it does anything converting Entity Framework to a new version. So you'll have to try if that works. I haven't tried that myself, to be honest. We can probably get you that question because we have plenty of people internally that use Entity Framework. What's the URL to the SAML Controls Gallery? It's actually a Windows Store app. So if you go into the Windows Store and look for for control gallery or WinUI or SAML control gallery. Uh, it deploys as a Windows store app and you get the automatic updates. And that, by the way, is another thing that's interesting. If you do deploy your app as a Windows store app, that's another way to deploy an update. Uh, probably whole state.net topic on its own, but just to mention that real quickly. 
What would I personally recommend today for developing new desktop apps that are multi-platform? That is a really difficult question because right now, if you want to be truly multi-platform, you probably need to go with one of the web-based technologies. So that leads you down the Electron or hopefully now Fotino path. Or you could use Xamarin Forms, but frankly, Xamarin Forms is currently very weak in Windows. So that'll change with Maui. But, you know, asking today, you probably only have the choice to go with one of these, these uh, HTML-based technologies. Is there an alternative or an evolution of the PRISM framework? Now, I said before I didn't want to call out any frameworks <laughs> that seem to cause problems. Uh, PRISM is, I believe, still continuously developed. I, have, I was originally involved in PRISM. I'm not involved with it now, haven't been in a long time. And I'm not up to speed with what PRISM does or how they are evolving. And, uh, you know, the alternative would be something like MVVM Lite or our code framework. When Windows Store is blocked by corporate IT, is there an alternative to pull from the store? Uh, not that I know. And right there, you put the finger on an open wound, right? Store deployment, as cool as it is in some ways, is also very restrictive in others. And in my opinion, has been a big hurdle for UWP apps to overcome, even though you can now do things like side loading. Uh, but if your IT department blocks that in general, then it's also probably not opening anything up for side loading. So in, in your scenario that I'm assuming you're asking for here, it probably won't help you. All right. And I think that's the last question we had. Again, ping us if you have more. A lot of times people think about stuff after these events end and, uh, and we are happy to answer those questions. So thank you very much. And I hope uh, to see you all again online next month for State of DevOps and in the month after for State of Azure Cloud. Thank you very much. Bye.